So today's keynote will be from Tom Schröder, uh, who's in Jana Eisenberg's lab at Harvard, and it will be on polymer controlled crystal growth and heat release. And for now, I'm super excited, Tom, to have you here. Uh, take it away. And yeah, can't wait for the discussion. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, as Allison said, today I'm going to be talking to you about um, polymer controlled crystal growth and heat release. I'm Tom Schrader. Uh, I'm a postdoc in Joanna Eisenberg's lab at Harvard and a 2021 Foresight Fellow in the Molecular Machines subgroup. Um, so I want to kick things off by bringing up the most recent uh, brainstorm question that that was posted, uh, which is from Professor Anne-Sophie Douet. Um, and it was what strategies could exploit the mechanical work provided by the rotation or translation of molecular machines in the macroscopic world. Now, I love this question because a, it, um, sort of touches on a thing that I think about a lot, uh, when I, when I think about molecular machines, chemistry in general, uh, which is how can we exploit nanoscale transformations and interactions to do things that that we can see that we, uh, produce changes on, um, the scale on which we sort of live and experience the world. Um, and, uh, so I'm going to posit an answer to that today. Um, and that answer is that, uh, we can use sort of molecular machines and other kind of similar processes, um, to control the growth of crystals. And that th this is a way of sort of translating, um, a lot of that nanoscale activity into the macro scale. Um, so let's see, uh, to start with an example, um, what you see on your screen is the unit cell of KDP, which is potassium dihydrogen phosphate. Um, the unit cell of, uh, of KDP is about uh, seven angstroms to a side. It's tetragonal. Um, and so it's, you know, a very, very small volume, uh, and it's order on a very small scale, but it can be propagated very successfully, uh, to a very large volume. So this is a, um, a KDP crystal, this is a, uh, you know, it's on, it's on the meter scale and it's been grown very carefully over a very long time, uh, to attain optical purity and, and like sort of favorable properties for use at the national ignition facility, um, uh, where it's basically sliced into, uh, slabs and used as an optical switch for lasers. It has sort of interesting optical properties. Um, so that's, you know. An example of kind of the, the, uh, different levels of hierarchical length scales that we can, we can sort of discuss here. Um, and another piece of this puzzle, uh, is the idea that you can use nanoscale interactions in order to control the morphology, the polymorph, the properties, um, of crystalline materials. So, um, a great example of this is in. A lot of life, frankly, but it's some, some really spectacular examples, uh, exist in marine life. Um, so marine organisms often have skeletal structures that are made of calcite, which is a, uh, a polymorph of calcium carbonate. And, um, in a lot of cases, uh, these structures are single crystalline, uh, but they don't look like most crystals that you think of normally. Um. So as I mentioned, I'm in Joanna Eisenberg's group and, um, Joanna uh, earlier in her career studied some of these, uh, structures, uh, expressed by marine organisms. Um, so here's an example of, um, sea urchin spines, which are, are single crystalline calcite and also brittle star spines, um, and, and skeletal elements form kind of these, uh, cool porous, uh, structures out of, again, single crystalline calcite. There's this, uh, technique called epitaxial overgrowth, which demonstrates the fact that these are single crystalline very well, uh, by sort of, so what, what you do is you take, um, a structure like this and you, you put it in a, uh, super saturated, um, uh, calcium carbonate environment as a solution, uh, such that more sort of grows onto the structures, um, and they all grow with the same orientation, which is again, a, a very good sort of, uh, demonstration that this is, uh, these are single crystalline structures. So the question is how, um, and truthfully, we are, we don't know how uh, in a like full or complete way. Um, but what we do know is that, um, macromolecules in solution, uh, play a role in locally controlling the growth of, of these crystalline, uh, structures. So on the left of the sort of bottom image is a geometrically, basically perfect, um, crystal of calcite that's been grown from a uh, solution uh, in without, without any impurities or additives. But if you, uh, take as uh, my advisor did, um, 
the macromolecular extract from the spines of sea urchins um, and you grow calcite crystals in solution in that environment, you can see that um, basically the, uh, those macromolecules bind to certain crystalline planes selectively, slowing down the growth of those planes. Now, when you're looking at a crystal, you're, uh, the planes that you can see are the slowest growing planes, generally speaking. Um, and so uh, the, the macromolecular extract from, from these sea urchin spines is, is picked planes other than the ones that are sort of uh, naturally the slowest in, in pure solution. Um, in order to create sort of a, a, a different and more complex geometry. Now, this is again, far from the, um, sort of perfection of the, the, uh, uh, biogenic spines, but still it's, it's, it shows how these molecules can exert, um, influence over, over the growth of, of crystalline materials. Uh, there are some other really cool examples of, um, biological, uh, molecules that through nanoscale interactions are able to exert control over crystalline, um, crystalline materials. Uh, and those have to do generally speaking with ice. Um, so, uh, the, um, there are across a number of taxa of life, um, organisms that express either ice nucleating proteins or, uh, anti-freeze proteins, but both of them sort of work in a similar way, which is to say that they exhibit, um, a periodicity that matches the lattice of ice crystals, uh, all in one or multiple plants. So there's this bacterium called Pseudomonas syringae, um, that, uh, expresses, so it does this sort of spectacularly. It, it, uh, expresses on the outside of its, of, of its cells, um, these ice nucleating proteins that together with membrane curvature, uh, induce the formation of ice crystals. Now they do this to, um, cause damage to plants so that they might better infect them. Um, but we have found a different application for these bacteria, uh, in inactivated form, they were put into artificial snowmakers. Um, so they, they, they do in fact nucleate an uh, ice crystal formation that well, that we can, uh, you know, use them to make, um, artificial snow with a, a certain you know, degree of monodispersity or whatever characteristics they look like, or they look for when they're trying to make, trying to make snowflakes, uh, at ski resorts. Um. So like I said, uh, there are also antifreeze proteins. Um, so this here is um, an example of an antifreeze protein that again, has this, uh, sort of periodic structure uh, that is capable of binding to the ice lattice. Uh, this is expressed by, um, the Eastern spruce budworm, uh, which is a certain type of caterpillar. But again, these, uh, these are expressed through uh, a number of taxa, including insects and plants and also fish. So this handsome fellow here is the ocean pouch. Uh, I assume it is named that way because it looks like it's pouting. Um, and, uh, it, uh, it, so th these, these fish, they live, um, pretty near me actually off the coast of New England. Uh, I'm based in the Boston area. Um, and, uh, it gets cold in the water, um, out in the ocean out here and, uh, particularly during the winter. So in order to stay alive during, um, uh, sub-zero conditions, uh, these, these fish express antifreeze proteins, um, and Unilever, which is a consumer product company that makes a whole bunch of things, um, and, uh, notably makes many ice cream brands, um, has begun, uh, or about a decade ago, they began, um, expressing these proteins from the ocean pouch, uh, in, uh, and putting them into their non-fat ice cream formulations, uh, in order to avoid ice crystal formation to get better texture. Uh, so that's just another sort of already commercialized example of, of these interactions controlling crystalline materials. So up till now, I've, I've, uh, talked to you about crystallization processes that are, um, generally speaking, uh, have, they happen on the slow time scales that you're used to when you think about something freezing or when you think about, uh, a crystal growing, but, um, I'm going to present today some original research and that research is going to be mostly to do with crystallization taking place on a much faster time scale. Uh, so you're about to see a movie and, and it is in real time of, uh, so-called hot ice crystallizing. So, um, Let's see, this is me throwing seed crystals into a Petri dish full of a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. Um, it forms the trihydrate very quickly and very exothermically. Um, 
So you may have encountered this in your lives, particularly if you, um, you know, live in a cold place or, you know, do winter sports. Um, these, uh, this crystallization process is best known for, uh, uh, existing in these hand warming heating packs that contain within them a little clicker, um, that sort of destabilizes seed crystals. Um, and so when you, uh, when you want to, uh, warm your hands on a cold day, you're carrying around this sort of water balloon full of super, super saturated solution. You click the clicker, destabilize seed crystals, and then the whole thing becomes basically a hot rock that uh, can keep you warm for about an hour. Um, uh, this actually, um, so there was a Canadian PhD student uh, about five years ago who uh, wrote his thesis on a similar system, basically scaled up. Um, and the idea behind it was you keep essentially bigger versions of these kind of hand warmers um, in reservoirs in your home. Uh, and during uh, off-peak times, when energy commitment rate is very cheap, um, using sort of a, a, an ohmic heating process they, they uh, take this energy and melt these salt solutions um, and they stay metastable uh, until such time as you want to heat water or air within your home, which typically is the same time that everyone else in the country wants to heat water and air within their home. Uh, so energy is more expensive then, and this is a way of sort of uh, taking stress off of the grid as well as providing cheaper uh, HVAC services for, for homes and buildings. Um, and yeah, like I said, these solutions, um, they, uh, in a liquid form, they're in a metastable state that, you know, if, if they're nucleated, they very rapidly and very exothermically form these crystals, but they can stay in these metastable states for a very long time. Um, anecdotally in some, in the lab with some of my own samples, I've had them last for, uh, over a year. I've had some files on the bench just sitting there for a very long time. Um, so overall. The point that I want to make with this talk is that um, crystallization can serve as an amplifier. Um, it takes angstrom scale order and amplifies that to macro scale material properties um, that might be of interest. Um, it takes macro or it takes molecular scale interactions, which is really is where molecular machines can very easily come in um, using additive model that molecules such as the macro macromolecules found in the um, skeletons of uh marine life and also by the way uh in our own bones and teeth um our own sort of uh mineralized tissues are templated by collagen for example and and uh, involve sort of very complex deposition processes um but from those interactions some of those interactions you kind of get uh the changes in geometry and orientation and polymorph and all sorts of other um properties that exist within these crystalline materials um I've also focused, by the way, on, on uh, single crystalline materials, just rhetorically here, but also polycrystalline materials can be sort of modified in this way as well, I should note, um, like composites and that sort of thing. And yeah, finally, uh, again, the, the um, act of crystallization itself from a, from a seed um, can sort of be used as this uh, responsive amplifying type scheme uh, that produces a large heat release, a large mechanical change, a large optical change. And, um, this is all, again, if, if thought, thought of from sort of a signal processing perspective, uh, amplification processes going on. So, um, today, uh, again, we're going to talk more about, about some of this hot ice stuff, some of this, um, exothermic crystallization, um, and we will address the following questions. Uh, so first of all, can we pattern crystal growth and heat release using, um, macromolecular additives? And the answer is yes. Otherwise I wouldn't have a talk today. Um, then, uh, what kind of temperature profiles can we create in this way and what might they be useful for? Uh, and then, um, how do polymers slow down crystal growth? Um, and how might molecular machines fit in? So, um, as I mentioned, uh, yes, I, I have been able to, uh, pattern crystal growth and heat release using macro macromolecular additives in the, the way I've been able to do that, this is using a photomasking approach. So, uh, we start on the left here with a, uh, super saturated solution of sodium acetate in water, uh, that also contains within it monomers, uh, acrylic monomers. So acrylamide is my sort of base thing that I work with here. Um, although you could use others as well, um, as well as a cross linker, uh, so it's, uh, bisacrylamide and a photo initiator. Um, in this case, I used alpha ketoglutaric acid, um, 
And I take this solution and I expose it to UV light uh, under a mask. So certain areas are protected from exposure to UV light. Um, and everywhere else that is not masked, uh, polymerizes. So polymerization reaction takes place, uh, leaving, giving us sort of a hydrogel with um, these channels in it that are unpolymerized. So uh, then when I nucleate the crystallization process within this milieu, uh, the crystal growth proceeds rapidly through the sort of masked areas that I've, that I've uh, made. So um, I'm going to show you a video of this happening, um, and this will be at 10 times speed, but um, just to give you some orientation, basically what you're looking at is a flat channel made of glass uh, with like, so two glass slides um, with spacers sandwiched between them and um, the solution injected in there. And that's where the sort of masking and polymerization took place as well as the nucleation that you'll see on camera. Um, so here is that happening again at uh, 10 times speed. And you can see that the um, crystallization process follows uh, the masked regions. It also follow, follows the interfaces in the system. And that's for a number of reasons that um, are not fully theor theorized. And it's mostly sort of an artifact at this point, but um, yeah, we're not going to dwell on that for, for too long. But again, um, rapid crystallization in these, in these masked regions. Um, and here's a closer look under a microscope through a cross polarizer. So you can see uh, basically the macroscopic needles growing uh, first rapidly through the um, unpolymerized region on the left, uh, then sort of slowly propagating out from the interface, um, a polycrystalline composite sort of forming uh, from, from the right. Um, and uh, then there's this secondary nucleation cascade that happens uh, sort of between the large needle-like crystals uh, that eventually sort of overtakes the mass re region. Uh, but by volume, that's actually not too much of the system. And we can tell that from the heat measurements that we take later. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, the, the, uh, polymerization process slows down crystallization, uh, but I did some composition studies and, um, basically the more monomer you have in either the polymerized or unpolymerized case, the slower the crystallization is. Um, and so, so these white circles here are the uncured solutions, uh, the velocity, um, uh, as a function of the concentration of monomer. Um, when you cure the, the solution, the rate goes down further and, um, the factor by which the rate goes down further increases, the more monomer you have, it's just red, the curve here. Um, interestingly, uh, so again, this, uh, there's a fairly strong dependence here on the monomer concentration within the solution. There is not, however, a very strong dependence on the cross-linking density, uh, which I found to be sort of interesting and counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, basically the, the rule here is that the higher sort of, um, the ratio between the rates that you want to use, the more monomer that you have to use in, in these systems. Um, so like I said, we can create sort of interesting temperature profiles in this way. Um, here are two infrared videos, uh, side by side, one polymerized and one not. Um, and as you can see, the unpolymerized case, um, A moves quite a lot faster and, uh, B gets quite a lot higher. Um, so the, the shape, shape profiles of the sort of receding fronts are different as well. And that's again, because of the sort of edge effect in the polymerized case. Um, but yeah, the, 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 um, speed and the degree of heating are kind of the two main takeaways here. Um, and, uh, it turns out that the temperature profile around the, uh, growth front, the crystals reaches a steady state, uh, and we can model it pretty well. Um, basically I, I, uh, derived an, an analytical mod model and I, of the heat transfer problem of this, um, this situation and found basically that the, uh, the temperature profiles around this crystallization front depend on four main parameters, uh, the crystal growth rate and thermal diffusivity, the latent heat. So the, the uh, amount of energy released during crystallization, which is a material property. Uh, and then the extent of dissipation to an external heat sink. Um, and so those bottom three parameters, um, which are again, uh, material parameters more or less in, in the last case, but uh, sort of an experimental setup parameter, um, can be held constant. Um, and, uh, basically I, I was able to perform a global fit of both of my curves, um, to 
the same set of those three parameters while only varying the velocity uh, and found basically that this full uh, 15 degrees Celsius difference in the peak temperature reached um, is basically only because of the change in velocity here, um, which makes a certain amount of intuitive sense, right? It's, it's uh, faster energy release will give you a hotter system. Um, but yes, basically that's, uh, again, it's, it's worth noting do just to this sort of, uh, micro scale or nano scale interactions with the polymeric species that I've created here in solution. Um, and that's, you know, again, 15 C is, uh, is a fairly respectable difference. And we'll see what we can do with that difference in a minute. Um, so again, we make these heat waves. Um, now what can you do with a heat wave? Well, one thing you can do with a heat wave is you can produce a wave-like response in any material that responds to heat. Um, so there are, uh, these thermoresponsive gels. Um, so th the one that everyone knows is, uh, poly and isopropyl acrylamide or poly uh, but there are others as well. And, um, these gels undergo a contraction response, uh, at around 32 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's, it's a very sharp response at, that happens at that temperature. So, so above that temperature, um, the polymers sort of exist in this collapsed form. Uh, and then below that temperature, they exist in this in, uh, very solvated swollen form. Um, so when you go from, uh, room temperature to above 32 degrees Celsius, uh, you would expect this gel to contract. You would expect to see in this case, a contraction wave. And in fact, that is what we see. Uh, so this is a confocal Z stack. Um, the XZ plane can be seen uh, at the top of the movie, which in the loop. Um, but yeah, basically it, uh, it contracts, uh, in a wave from left to right, uh, and then slowly reswells. Um, it's sort of a peristaltic motion. It's a, um, a, a motion that is similar to, uh, sort of the wave-like contractions that happen within, for example, um, smooth muscle within like uh, your digestive system, um, and, uh, potentially could be useful for, for, um, applications involving that type of, uh, movement of cargo. Um, these NIPAM films are commercially used as, uh, coatings on cell culture plates. And so the idea is that you, um, trigger a volume change like this and you detach the cells. So perhaps you could do so in a wave-like fashion if you're, uh, attempting to, um, achieve some sort of control over the process. Um, and so again, the way I introduced the system was, uh, it involved sort of the photo masking that you can do with it. So, um, here we have three videos of the same process happening here. Uh, in the top left, we have the, uh, the, just a, a normal video on the top right. We have an infrared video, which, uh, was, was turned into a heat map. Um, and then on the bottom right, I've thresholded that heat map so that, um, anything that ever exceeds a certain temperature in this case, 34 and a half degrees, um, is shown in green and everything that currently exceeds that temperature, uh, is, is shown in black. Um, and basically this thresholding algorithm approximates what you would get from a, um, a thermal responsive process that's activated when that threshold is exceeded. Um, so this sort of shows that we can program areas where a process like that would happen versus would not happen. Um, and it's, it would happen mostly within this mask. Um, there are some sort of parts in the outlying areas where fronts converge that get rather warm. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it is in fact within the mask that front convergence also can be exploited. Um, as in this case, so I, here I've removed the heat sink that's present in most of these, um, most of these experiments and now the hottest places in the system are the places where the fronts converge. Um, so here, uh, yeah, we see this sort of array of dots, uh, where I've programmed sort of fast crystallization paths around the centers of these sort of closed hexagons, uh, and that produces this, this dot array. Um, right. So, uh, as, um, as I've been building up to, we can basically, uh, use this sort of patterning approach to, um, restrict actuation to areas where, uh, I have masked the underlying crystallizing species. So, um, you might expect, uh, as indeed happens that you can get, uh, 
contraction of a thermoresponsive gel like this to selectively proceed only in areas um, where uh, that have been masked during during polymerization, whereas the contraction does not happen in areas that uh, were exposed to the UV light uh, and underwent polarization. Um, and in fact, that happens. Um, so on the left here is the masked area and it contracts and the, um, the unmasked area next to it does not contract uh, during crystallization. And um, so that's kind of a spatial selectivity that we get from the system based on um, the uh, rate of crystal growth versus uh, the sort of background rate of heat dissipation. Um, so we can, we can activate other, uh, thermally activated processes using a similar kind of approach. Um, so here, what I've done is I've taken a, uh, a Kim wipe, which is like a, just a very sort of thin sheet of paper, basically, uh, like a lab Kleenex pretty much. Um, and onto this Kim wipe, I have, uh, rubbed a crayon that I made out of icosane. I icosane is a wax. It melts at, uh, around. 36 degrees Celsius, um, and I've, I've doped in some dye to this psychosane. And, uh, so I've sort of rubbed one side with this crayon covered or with, with, with this crayon depositing a layer of wax, uh, and then put this, uh, this Kim wipe onto my crystallizing species that I've patterned. And this is the results. Um, so, uh, the crystals grow, um, they heat up. Selectively, the areas above um, that are masked above the, the melting point of the wax, and it spells out the word hot here, uh, which is the shape of the mask that I use to um, trigger the whole the whole thing. Um, so this has been sort of some some examples of um, a process, and then the sort of macroscopic things that you can do with that process using, um, again, the interactions between. Uh, polymers, in this case polyacrylamide, and a crystallizing species. Um, now, there's a question of why this happens. And in my particular system, um, which is, again, a hydrogel, which is a fairly complex environment, um, there are actually several um, possible mechanisms by which uh, the polymerization might be slowing down crystal growth. Um, they are all uh, valid in some cases, and um, it is... The, the thing that I and I have been trying to figure out um, is sort of the degree to which they're relevant in, in my case. Um, but uh, that's sort of beside the point of, of this talk. Um, basically, uh, so I, I'm going to go into detail on one of these potential mechanisms, uh, this additive adsorption mechanism, um, which is uh, certainly the case in, in, in enough crystallization sort of conditions that uh, it becomes relevant to us. It, as people consider molecular machines, um, whether or not it is in fact the dominant, uh, the dominant effect shown in our system. Um, so generally speaking, um, if you put a, uh, an additive species or an impurity species into a, um, solution where crystals are growing, uh, and the additive absorbs to the surface of the growing crystals, um, then they inhibit growth. Um, and so one possibility here is that, um, again, my, my sort of main comparison of growth rates is between regions where, um, the, uh, additives, which are polymerizable monomers have been polymerized versus have not been polymerized. Um, and so one possibility is that, uh, these species in both forms are absorbing to the surfaces of the crystals. Um, but in the polymerized form, they're more effective, uh, crystal absorbance than the monomers are. Um, and this is possible, uh, based on sort of cooperative effects and it's been shown in the literature before. Um, so here we see, uh, a plot on the left, a plot of, uh, the step growth rates of calcite, uh, which again, is, is, uh, a polymorph of calcium carbonate. Um, measured by in situ AFM. Um, and in the solution, there are these, uh, oligopeptides made of, um, uh, aspartate. So, so either monomeric aspartate or uh, a dimer or a tri or a, a tetramer, um, and then up to six. Um, and at some point there's, uh, a concentration that you can add that stops crystal growth entirely. Um, and so that concentration drops drastically. This is a logarithmic scale. Uh, the more, um, the more, uh, monomers you have per oligopeptide. Um, 
So uh, this is because the, or that at least the, the, the correlation is very strong with the binding energy of the peptides to the uh, surface of the calcite crystals. Um, and again, this is uh, presumably because of cooperative effects um, associated with there being, you know, multiple binding groups on the, uh, the, the higher molecular weight peptides. Um, so generally speaking, these, um, there, there are a few additive adsorption models, uh, that sort of determine crystal growth rates in the presence of certain concentrations of additives. Um, and by and large, they depend on three parameters. They depend on the concentration of the impurity or the additive in solution. They depend on the binding affinity of that additive for the crystal surface, and they depend on a steric effectiveness factor, which um, sort of incorporates a bunch of effects associated with the surface energy and the sterics of the system. Um, but by and large, um, I, I have fit these models to our data. Um, I should note that the uh, to fit these models to the data where the independent variable is the concentration of monomeric acrylamide in the system is sort of an imperfect thing to do uh, because instead of, it would be one thing if um, this was concentration data of a monodisperse polymeric species uh, and I were plotting it sort of against the concentration of that species, but um, I've sort of done a, a random free radical polymerization, uh, which will produce a polydisperse uh, sort of set of, of polymers. Um, and uh, so, so the comparison is not is not perfect, but uh, still the fits are pretty good, and the uh, fit values that I obtain um, do point to the effect that the binding affinity is increasing um, between the unpolymerized and the polymerized case. So, um, basically, this is just to say that there is an opportunity area here. I think for molecular machines, uh, in terms of how you might use um, nanoscale. Uh, effects and transformations to uh, change something that manifests on the macro scale. Um, again, uh, these parameters, um, the binding affinity, the uh, effective local concentration, and sort of the sterics of the system, um, potentially are things that can be changed uh, using the types of responsive chemistries that we like to think about when we think about molecular machines. Um, which means that you uh, can sort of selectively alter or uh, even completely halt uh, crystal growth based on the surrounding conditions or the activity of the machines that you've sort of incorporated, um, giving rise to the potential for the sculpting of crystalline materials using molecular interactions. Uh, and I'll give sort of a final example of um, a, a way forward in this in this way. Um, so uh, again, I, I've been using polyacrylamide uh, as my additive to these crystallizing solutions. And it turns out that um, under certain conditions, polyacrylamide undergoes uh, a so-called UCSD phase transition. This is the opposite of what, what NIPAM does. Basically, it uh, exists in a well-solvated uh, coil conformation above a certain threshold temperature. Uh, but then below that threshold temperature, it collapses into insoluble globules. Um, and so here I have a vial of this gel um, and uh, it's sitting on a cold plate that's held to 10 degrees Celsius. And you can very clearly see that the bottom is turbid uh, because the bottom part of this vial is sort of below this critical transition temperature. Um, so I'm going now to nucleate the uh, vial from the top. Um, and you'll be able to kind of see that uh, crystal growth proceeds um, at one rate until it hits the sort of cloudy region, at which point it moves a lot faster. Yes, it's secured a little bit by the growth along the edges, but I'll show you some more examples of, of this effect happening that um, kind of will, will uh, obviate that concern. Um, I, I did a, a uh, systematic study of uh, the relationship of the uh, growth rates to the temperature in the system and found basically that um, Below the transition temperature, you see a very sharp discontinuous rise in the growth rates. Um, so in collapsing to the globule form, um, the message here is that the, the polymers become significantly less effective um, uh, adsorbers to the crystal surface. Um, uh, or uh, perhaps something proceeds by one of the other mechanisms at play during the system. But generally speaking, you are able to allow faster crystal growth um, using a molecular transformation of this additive. Um, 
here is uh, sort of another video of this effect happening. Um, so I'm, I'm going to play these three videos at the same time. The left case um, is this point here. It's the, the uh, case without any uh, acrylamide in the system. Um, and uh, it's at 16 degrees Celsius. On the right, we're looking at the equivalent temperature in the, uh, the case with polymer. So there's polyacrylamide in the system at 16 degrees Celsius. And then in the middle, um, it's polyacrylamide in the system, but at 14 degrees Celsius. So, so this point here, um, and I'll play this now. And you can see that the, um, the, uh, case at 14 degrees Celsius with polyacrylamide, the crystals are growing as fast as if there were no polyacrylamide there at all, but just two degrees warmer, you get significantly slower crystal growth. Um, showing again, the, the sort of dependence of, uh, crystal growth on these molecular effects. Um, so again, uh, I, I believe that this is an opportunity area for molecular machines. Um, and I hear, I hear I've used polymers as kind of the, the relevant species, um, because I find these, uh, sort of critical phase behavior phenomena to be convenient, uh, to work with and also well suited to my system, which is in hydrogels, which are themselves composed of polymer, um, can pol polymer backbones. Uh, but there's no reason why in principle, other, um, additives might not be used. Um, other, uh, things like, for example, photo switches was the subject of a talk, uh, that we recently, uh, had in this group and those might be relevant here as well. Um, any, any sort of molecular transformations are fair game for doing this kind of thing. So long as you can successfully couple them to crystal growth rates. Um. So that is the talk. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank a few other people uh, as well. So uh, again, my uh, faculty advisor is Joanna Eisenberg at Harvard, um, and I'd like to thank her for sort of creating a space for this research and really supporting it. Um, and uh, additionally, the rest of the group, and particularly the people whose names you can see on the screen, um, have have been uh, helpful at various points during the work. Um, and the work was funded by a postdoc fellowship from the Swiss National Science Foundation, as well as the DOE and the ARO. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the folks at Foresight for uh, making this talk possible. I uh, am looking currently for a tenure track faculty position. So if you uh, are on a search committee and you like what you see, please drop me a line. Um, and also I will be guest editing a special issue of the journal Gels uh, coming up here in the next uh, few months. And so uh, if you'd like to contribute to that, a link is on the screen. Also, this work exists as a preprint on Chem Archive. And the DOI is up there as well. Um, so that is what I've got for you. Um, Thank you so much. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to uh, unshare your screen just for now. Uh, lovely. Thank you so, so much. Fantastic work uh, and a lot to discuss. Uh, I have a question from Ben Snowden uh, first here, who also PS did with very cool talk. Ben, do you want to go first? Hi, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and like really clearly presented things, which, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, I'm just, I, so I'm sure you said it, but yeah, how, how, how big are the channels and, uh, or the masks and how small can you make them and what are sort of like the considerations that, uh, that go into the, the kind of minimum size. And it's actually a very good question. And frankly, I haven't probed that to in too much detail. Um, the, so I know that I've made channels with, um, so, okay. So one thing that is true is that, uh, the, the thing that functionally has been a practical limitation, um, for getting like very small line widths is the photopolymerization process. Uh, it's sort of the nature of the masks that I use. Um, I did find, so because my system is under glass, um, I have to then overlay a mask onto that glass. And so there's some like weird wonky edge effects that can happen when you do that sort of thing. So, um, I basically tried to keep my, uh, line widths on the millimeter scale typically. Um, so, uh, that's, I, th I think if you were able to achieve perfect masking, um, then you could go significantly smaller. Although in terms of how, how much smaller, I guess, eventually you would run up against, um, the, uh, however many sort of diffusional degrees of freedom that each polymer chain has, right. Uh, I used a, a cross-linked polymer system, but, um, you know, there will be sort of a, 
a distance between crosslinks uh, and uh, the chains between crosslinks will have a certain amount of flexibility. And so if those chains can sort of dip into the area with um, uh, that has been masked, then maybe the effect would not be so great. But on the scale of millimeters, at least, uh, things work pretty well. Lovely, fantastic. Okay, I'll have a few questions, and uh, this is also an invitation. If you guys want me to stop talking, then feel free to ask the question yourselves. Uh, you can either raise your hand or do so uh, in the chat. Um, oh, we have one. That was quick. Uh, you, you Ching Yao, you go first, please. Oh, sure. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Uh, nice talk. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. So is the whole process reversible? Like, can you melt there and then do the uh, heating again? Or Yeah, so um, definitely in particularly the like, commercialized applications of this stuff, um, yes. So the, the, the heat packs that you can buy uh, are designed to be thrown in a pot of boiling water and remelted every time. Now, my case, um, the so... I have done some preliminary experiments to uh, making the system reversible and kind of to, to see how many cycles I can get out of it. Um, I do have a problem that comes up when this happens just experimentally, and it seems like if I could find a way around it, then I could make it reversible because it does seem at first blush like indeed the, um, the second time you try crystallizing such a system, uh, the crystals grow in the masked paths again, uh, and then they grow slow, more slowly through the rest of the um, unmasked medium. Uh, again as well. And this is consistent with some other reports of similar systems that have shown um, no damage to sort of the gel structure uh, that's created. Um, but when you crystallize certain uh, salts within, within them. Uh, my problem is that my system is bounded by a container. <laughs> and uh, also that the boundaries of that container, um, when they're not silenized to uh, covalently like include the walls of the system in the polymer network, um, uh, crystallization proceeds fast along, along those interfaces. Um, so during crystallization, the system densifies significantly because it's going from sort of a liquid medium to a solid medium that is denser. Um, and so what happens during that process, um, is particularly when crystallization fronts are converging, um, it puts stresses on the system such that it delaminates from the, um, the walls. And, uh, when you try then recrystallizing that, uh, that system that you've made, oftentimes the crystal growth will be faster along those sort of delaminated areas, kind of eliminating, um, the, the spatial, uh, patterning that you've done, giving you sort of confounding effects. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, but, uh, in principle for, on like a microscopic level, I, I do think that, um, in fact, this would be a reversible thing as well. Um, yeah, that's cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right, lovely. Well, um, I think that, you know, based on Andrew's question, which you started the presentation with, I would love to um, say it. Oh, well, first, I'm going to read out her prompt again, her challenge. She basically asked the challenge, what strategies could exploit the mechanical work produced by the rotation of translation of molecular machines in the macroscopic world? And you already uh, touched on this a little bit with your talk, but uh, do you perhaps, uh, you know, want to... Um, yeah, make another uh, um, attempt or just another um, more targeted focus of like how is your work relevant uh, to her challenge and like what what do you think is uh, are interesting next steps in, in order to solve it? Yeah, no, and so let's see. I think um, that the work is relevant to the challenge insofar as the, the effects produced are macroscopic um, and the sort of underlying phenomena are microscopic. Um, and uh, the, it is, it is, Perhaps not the case in this sort of initial work, except for the phase change stuff, which I'll come to, um, that what's happening is sort of a molecular machine type effect. But um, in the future, I do think sort of exploring these kind of phase transitions uh, and being able to um, sort of do this kind of sculpting in response to uh, environmental cues or to um, sort of the, the uh, autonomous behavior of molecular species. Uh, is a really interesting direction to go in and might um, provide a whole bunch of different sort of ways to think about uh, control of crystalline systems, uh, which again, as I sort of presented in the beginning, might have relevance across a whole number of application spaces from, um, you know, creating materials with inter interesting thermal properties to interesting optical properties to structural properties to functional composites with like programmed anisotropy, you know, I could go on, but... <laughs> um, 
yeah, <laughs> that is a, a direction that I will be pursuing in the future, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thanks. And, uh, do you, in terms of like the next, I guess this is, uh, you know, the difficult part of connecting the very long term to the current one, but do you have any, you know, particular work that you think will be really exciting to start over the next like five to 10 years or so, either that you are doing or, you know, what you'd like to see others do? Yeah, I, so, um, I really am a, a big fan of biologists in general. Um, and so a, because, you know, a, anyone who claims to do sort of bio-inspired science has to have some reservoir to draw from of, of, uh, you know, the things that are inspiring us. Um, and so I think something that is, uh, important in the long term for, um, sort of developing among scientists, a better understanding of the world, um, is to, uh, for people to be examining, let me put this another way, for people to be funded to examine uh, biological systems. Like I said, there's a lot about sort of the uh, the development of these skeletal structures in, for example, marine organisms, but also in our own bones, say, um, that is not understood well. Um, and there's a lot of work that could be done um, uh, on, on kind of figuring out what is going on. Uh, and I think that is what I'm most excited to read about in the next five to 50 years <laughs> five to 15 did you say or 50 five oh <laughs> five oh well great uh, then all bets are off okay lovely and um you know maybe in a little bit more uh you know concrete ways you said you're looking currently for position could you tell say a little bit more about like what kind of work you'd be interested in doing there or yeah let's see so um i i have uh a family of projects that I would like to work on associated with this sort of, um, crystallization stuff. And I'm not going to give away all my ideas for free. Uh, but <laughs> the, the, um, I then also, uh, have a few sort of other directions. Uh, most notably, um, I, I, uh, have a longstanding interest in hydrogel ionotronics, which is to say, um, circuitry that uses ions, uh, instead of, or in addition to electrons as charge carriers. Um, and you can do this in, um, in uh gels and sort of the solution phase um using again yeah ions as charge carriers and solutions um and uh this is sort of a really cool opportunity to get molecular transformations to um sort of affect the electrical properties of a system uh, or of a circuit um and there's uh a number of things sort of attached to that I, I am personally interested in making, uh, I'm, I'm very inspired by excitable tissues in biology, which are, are this, they are circuits that, uh, operate based on the flow of ions. Um, and, uh, so my PhD work involved the creation of an electrical power source that was built like the electric eel was built. Um, and is a system that I'm really interested in these days is neurons. Um, so recapitulating sort of neuronal networks uh and and processes to form autonomous ionic circuits it's another thing that i very much want to do yeah um wow we just had a very relevant talk um on i guess you know that in particular as it relates to regeneration from mike 11 and our biotech yes. group. he's fantastic um, <laughs> yeah do you know in any way how your work may integrate with his or do you have any ideas there so it's, it's always interesting because um uh, he uses optogenetic tools and, um, the direction in which I want to take my work is sort of a synthetic recapitulation of optogenetics, um, in, in a certain way. Uh, so the works are certainly in conversation with each other. Um, the, it is possible that, um, something that might come out of my research directions, um, would involve some sort of biointerfaces, but, uh, for now I'm, I'm mostly sort of interested in getting a, um, synthetic system up and running without considering interfacing with biology too much. Um, but yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately, I guess one of Forsyth's hypothesis is that the most exciting work really happens at the intersection. So, you know, we have this molecular machines group, we have the biotech and health extension group, and then our computer science and machine learning group. And I think ultimately it would be really nice that over the next few years, uh, those groups would be talking much more also to each other. So I just shared Michael's talk uh, here, uh, in the chat. And yeah, it's a fantastic talk and maybe perhaps in a year or so there's potential for mergers. Um, okay, I also would love for you, uh, I mean, this is a more general question, but maybe to talk a little bit more about, um, you said that you were co-editing um, uh, in the Gels journal. Uh, could you uh, say a little bit more about this? 
Right. Yeah. So, so I, I was invited recently to um, be the guest editor on uh, a special issue of the journal Gels, uh, put out by MDPI. Um, and uh, it's so the the theme of the special issue is going to be functional transformations in polymer gels. Um, and it's uh, basically that uh, uh, encompasses transformations that occur either during the fabrication of a gel material or of um, or during the use of the gel material. So this also includes like stimuli responsive behaviors um, as well as I don't know. We're trying to keep it fairly broad um, and uh, be reasonably open minded to, to different submissions. Uh, we'll be looking at gels using um, sort of polymer backbones of all types and uh, as well as all types of solvents and other kind of things floating around in there. Um, and it's fairly broad in terms of the application spaces as well, but functional transformations in polymer gels. My co-author is, um, uh, was also uh, an alum of the, the Eisenberg lab. It's uh, Jimin Hep, um, at UCLA, uh, currently a assistant professor there. Um, she does beautiful work with, um, the hydrogels uh, and has produced some of the coolest responsive gel work that I've ever seen. Um, so, uh, I highly recommend that people look into her work, um, and also consider, uh, submitting to Seishu. Wow. Very interesting. Um, all right. So, um, I guess there's, uh, one, uh, potential, uh, area that, uh, or like a request for, where a request where you could be taking your work into, which is, um, someone would love if someone could figure out how to generate macroscopic form bone structures. <laughs> Uh, the mechanical properties of bones are quite competitive with traditional construction materials on a number of use for axes. If we could just grow it cheaply and intentionally outside of an organism, do you have any comments to this? So, um, I, <laughs> I hesitate to say too much about this simply because I know that like bone tissue engineering is a very active field with like a, a lot of people doing a lot of things. Um, so I, I, uh, it's, it, it is being done that, that people are sort of trying to, um, engineer sort of bone type structures, uh, in vitro. Um, and you know, oftentimes this involves, uh, using a, um, sort of customized scaffold. Uh, I think, um, mostly made of collagen as collagen is the scaffold of, of natural bone tissue as well. Um, but bones are really sort of worth, um, thinking about in detail because, um, it's a, it's a bones are a structural sort of, um, material that lasts a lifetime in, in human terms. And, um, and they're being constantly remodeled by, uh, these specialized cells called osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Um, and, uh, a lot of that remodeling takes place in a sort of sealed reaction chamber. Um, that's, uh, a, a, a very interesting thing. I'm also particularly interested in, um, uh, atherosclerotic plaque formation, which is sort of biomineralization gone wrong in a lot of ways. Um, it's a major cause of death in humans <laughs> and, um, is, uh, yeah, basically happens when, um, when, uh, certain cell bodies die in a certain way within the circulatory system. And then, um, these plaques event that, that result from this, uh, eventually sort of get build up from and um, circulating calcium, they, they calcify and this becomes a problem. Um, so, uh, there are a number of things related to human biomineralization, um, notwithstanding the entire field of dentistry, uh, that, um, you know, are, are, uh, interesting and relevant and, you know, um, potential impact spaces for work that involves the modification of crystal growth. Man, and again, another area that we also sometimes discuss in our biotech and health extension group. So maybe if you're interested in we're just there as well. Uh, okay, maybe then a final question to you, which would be, um, which we often, you know, and and end our talks with, even in the biotech group. You know, what would be helpful, you know, for your work in particular? You know, do you have any requests, um, uh, you know, that of just you know advancing your work in particular, or like the fields uh, that you're working in? Yeah, um, I will say that people who work with gels um, are always looking for new and improved imaging techniques. Uh, that's a thing that needs to be sort of brought further. Um, the so you know, if anyone's interested in developing uh, really cool imaging techniques for for porous gels, um, then that would be that would give everyone a hand in, in my field. I think. Um, so I think that's yeah, that's a big one for sure. Um, and that could also be, again, a request for all computer science and machine learning groups. So, maybe so. very well. 
Uh, thank you so, so much, Tom. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure to have you here. Um, I just want to reiterate that uh, Tom is a Foresight Fellow. If you're interested in becoming a Foresight Fellow in the next year, uh, then please apply via the application form that I'm sharing now. There are lots of different benefits that uh, we work out hand in hand with you, but this is the supportive program where basically we really try to work with you to see how we can advance your work. This could include presentations like this. This could include um, mentorship, one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship with individual folks. This could include uh, joining our in-person uh, meetups and gatherings. This could include uh, us sharing your work and promoting into your relevant interest groups. And so there's lots of different ways in which we try to help support you. Uh, you're also being integrated into uh, a fellowship cohort that grows over the years. This is now our fifth uh, fellowship cohort. So if you're interested in collaborating a little further on long-term progress in molecular machines, uh, if you know uh, anyone who could benefit from this, or if you're just interested in advancing your own work in the area, this may be for you. Um, all right. So uh, I got another question of what meeting uh, will be happening in uh, on Thursday. And on Thursday, at, again, at 11 a.m. PDT, we'll have Ayusman Sen and Job uh, Birkhoven, uh, who are presenting in a keynote presentation to this group. I'm going to send a reminder about, out about that tomorrow, because today we had uh, this presentation, so I didn't want to confuse you guys with the, uh, with the times. But uh, yeah, uh, you'll have a meeting uh, invite on that tomorrow. Okay, everyone, I'm hoping that some of you are also excited to answer Andrew's question and maybe Tom gave you a few ideas of how to do that uh, and receive a bounty for this. Tom, thank you so, so much um, from our whole group for presenting. And yeah, I can't wait uh, to collaborate closer. And um, everyone, I see you hopefully on Thursday.